Hello and welcome to The Angry Astronaut, part two of my double shot of content today. So it was announced less than 24 hours ago, actually, that NASA would be announcing its final decision for the sustainable HLS solution, the lander that will very possibly be transporting astronauts to the surface of the moon time and again as the Artemis program continues. Again, to make all of this program completely clear to you, the project that Starship was approved for only applies to Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. After that, anybody can provide a solution as long as they were part of either the original contract or the sustainable solution. And of course, as is indicated by the name, the sustainable lander is the lander that NASA anticipates can be used on an ongoing basis, what they consider to be a better ongoing solution for Artemis, or at least that is the theory behind the contract. Starship may indeed prove to be the best ongoing solution in general, and just absolutely dominates the entire HLS field as Artemis proceeds, but somehow I kind of doubt that. I think that there are many, many complications to the Starship program, many hurdles that it has to overcome, whereas both of the alternative solutions that were offered by its competitors were more straightforward and more simple. That being the case, though, I think there's also significant differences between these two alternatives, between these two sustainable HLS solutions that could have a massive impact as to whether or not Artemis is a success or Artemis is a failure. And we're going to take a brief look at both of these solutions, one of which will emerge victorious tomorrow in just a moment. And a quick detail, due to YouTube's collaboration with Teespring, they are offering a 25% discount on select merchandise offered by content creators. So I created a video that featured quite a number of these different items that this discount is being offered on. I have this video linked right here and also in the description if you want to check it out. If you're interested in getting some angry merch, this is the time. But let's check out the national team. The national team, however, has changed since the time that this promotional video was created, and Blue Origin has released no details whatsoever about their new lander. They still have Lockheed Martin and Draper, but they lost Northrop Grumman and replaced them with <coughs> Boeing. <coughs> However, they have also added Astrobotic to the team, which in my opinion was a very good add-on. So there have probably been many changes made to this lander configuration since the original proposal, but the only thing that's really changed in terms of the companies providing the solution is the transfer stage. Northrop Grumman was the company providing the transfer stage to drive the lander into a low lunar orbit to where it can be deployed. If that is the case, it may be that Boeing is providing the new transfer stage and very little has changed about the lander otherwise, but that is pure speculation. But here are the problems with this lander, at least the way that it was originally conceived, and I can't imagine that some of these things have changed that significantly. First of all, let's talk about sustainability. Now, if this lander turns out to be a hybrid of what Boeing originally proposed and what Blue Origin proposed, then they may end up using the exploration upper stage, in other words, what's going to replace the ICPS on the SLS rocket in order to drive the lander down into low lunar orbit. That makes the most sense to me and would require the fewest number of launches. That being the case then, assuming you could fit the entire Blue Origin lander inside the universal stage adapter for the Block 1B version of the SLS rocket, which ironically is being manufactured by Dynetics, their competitor in this whole thing, well, that means you could deploy the entire lander in a single launch in conjunction with the same Orion capsule being used for the moon mission in question. That means you wouldn't need any additional launches whatsoever. 
whatsoever. Everything could be contained inside the same SLS rocket. The universal stage adapter allows SLS to carry a substantial amount of payload, presumably enough for the Blue Origin lander and the Lockheed Martin ascent module, and the crew inside the Orion capsule all in the same launch. Now, if they could pull this off, it would mean that Artemis could carry out lunar landing missions in the same manner almost that Saturn V was able to do it. One launch, one landing. This offers a pretty significant advantage if it wasn't for one really, really big problem. First of all, if Artemis ever wants to carry any other kind of payload inside the Universal Stage Adapter, it won't be able to because all of the space will be gobbled up with a new lander every time you have to put down on the moon. There's very little reusability built into this design. Only the ascent module provided by Lockheed Martin would theoretically be reusable. The exploration upper stage on the SLS, not reusable. The descent module, which is the very heavy Blue Origin Blue Moon Lander, would also not be reusable. It would gobble up almost all of its fuel supply, setting down on the moon and would not be able to ascend again without some sort of in-situ propellant depot on the lunar surface, which you can't count on if you're exploring new regions of the moon. So without reusability, it means you're essentially going to have to pay for a new lander every single time. How does that make this sustainable? However, the fact that it only involves a single launch, that does make this system pretty attractive, at least in terms of simplicity, and may give Blue Origin the upper hand in this bid. But if NASA really wants a sustainable lunar lander, that means they want a reusable lunar lander, which is what the Alpaca is, and far more so than it was the first time Dynetics proposed this amazing lander. It now has the capability of being completely deployed and reused in a single launch. What does that mean? Well, you can put it inside the exploration upper stage on the SLS, just like the Blue Orbit origin lander, at least theoretically, and then refuel it with a single Vulcan Centaur launch. Now, it might take a three-core Vulcan Centaur or something along those lines to carry enough fuel. Difficult to determine, but there is another way to do this as well. You could also deploy the Alpaca with a Vulcan Centaur, and then just put enough fuel that's necessary for it to carry out its mission inside the exploration upper stage on the SLS. This would allow the SLS to carry a substantial amount of payload, plus the necessary fuel for the Alpaca, all in a single launch. In addition to that, once the Alpaca is deployed, it can be reused, which means after that, all you require is a single refueling mission every time you want to land on the moon, and you don't have to deploy any new landers. That is a huge advantage, obviously, and would cost a lot less money in the long run. It's a sustainable solution, and there are other things to consider as well. It's very possible that the exploration upper stage on the SLS is not going to be able to handle a fully fueled Blue Origin lander. It could be that they're going to need a separate refueling mission as well for their solution. In the original configuration, Blue Origin required three launches in order for this lander to set down on the moon, which was a huge advantage from their perspective because they were advertising that Starship was going to require at least ten launches to accomplish the same thing. Now, I think it's very likely that Starship will be able to get this done with fewer refueling missions, but if you include the launch of Lunar Starship itself, it's still going to require at least six launches of the biggest rocket in human history to set a couple of astronauts down on the surface of the moon. This was kind of a good point, but at the same time, it's going to cost a lot more money to go with a solution that requires a brand new lander every time you want to land on the moon. And honestly, I don't see how Blue Origin is going to 
be able to accomplish 100% reusability with something that was based on this original configuration. Boeing entering into the whole equation to me seems that they're going to be adding even less reusability to it given Boeing's philosophy over the last 20 years or so. And without reusability, there's going to be a considerable amount of expense. And as the expense goes up, the chances of Artemis being canceled in the long run also increases. We need reusability in Artemis at least at some point, especially given how expensive SLS is, if we want this program to continue. But there's an even more important consideration here. Safety. The Blue Origin Lander, at least the way it was originally designed, and once again, I don't see how they can make substantial changes to make up for these shortfalls. Well, this thing is far from safe, and I become even more convinced of this fact every time I see a mock-up of this lander. I'm six foot two. Look how colossal this thing is, and the enormously tall ladder that astronauts are going to have to climb to gain access to the crew capsule. And by the way, this is not the full height of the lander. It's not on its complete landing legs in this particular mock-up. So this is an enormously difficult ascent that astronauts are going to have to make in order to gain access to the safety of the crew capsule with every EVA. The Apollo astronauts often talked about the difficulty they experienced in ascending a ladder that was one quarter the height of this one, perhaps even shorter than that really. How much more difficult is it going to be to clamber up something like this in an environmental suit several times a day possibly depending on the nature of the mission and it gets even worse than that. If an astronaut experiences an injury or perhaps a breach in their suit sometime during their mission on the lunar surface, gaining access again to the safety of the crew capsule is going to be extremely difficult with a ladder like this. Now, some people talk about how it's not going to be that dangerous for astronauts to fall off of this thing because of 1-6 gravity, and I'm here to tell you that astronauts during the Apollo missions narrowly avoided catastrophe a number of times while they were just trying to navigate around on the lunar surface. Can you imagine how much more difficult and dangerous it's going to be if they were to fall five or six meters off of their lunar lander, perhaps hitting their faceplate on a rock or ripping their suit on the way down? This is just an unnecessary danger that Starship deals with by having an elevator. And not just one elevator, but redundant elevators and two redundant airlocks as well. This is one of the reasons why Starship won the original bid. The alpaca is just far more accessible and and far safer. I mean, look how easy it is to get to this crew hatch, at least as far as height is concerned, compared to the photos you saw previously of the Blue Origin lander. I mean, it's night and day. And there are further advantages to this low-slung configuration. First of all, the Alpaca can hard dock with a pressurized lunar rover, something that neither Starship nor the Blue Origin solution can offer. The ability to gain access to the Toyota Moon Cruiser, for example, that which is supposed to be deployed on the lunar surface by 2029 without having to conduct an EVA is an invaluable advantage, something that really only Alpaca has the capability of doing, and it gets even better than that. The Alpaca, because of its low-slung configuration, can land on substantial slopes, a grade of 10% or even more. They wouldn't tell Tell me exactly how steep of a grade Alpaca could land on. Suffice it to say that they feel that Alpaca is capable of landing right at the edge of Shackleton Crater, something that neither of Dynetic's competitors could possibly do. And keep in mind, the Lunar South Pole is nothing like the Apollo landing sites. It is far more rugged terrain 
far more dangerous, and you want a low slung configuration, not a tall lander that is prone to toppling over landing in this rough terrain. Alpaca is simply far safer and far more flexible than the Blue Origin solution, and really for a variety of different reasons, in terms of expense, in terms of reusability, in terms of safety, in terms of sustainability, this is the solution for the future of Artemis. But does that mean NASA is going to choose it tomorrow? I really have my doubts. I'm pretty certain that Jeff Bezos has thrown a great amount of money at this proposal, and since neither Dynetics nor Northrop Grumman, their new partner, has a billionaire founder, I think that's going to put them at a substantial disadvantage as far as the pricing is concerned for the first lander. But keep in mind, we're talking about sustainability here, not the upfront cost. But nevertheless, NASA may pay attention to upfront cost in order to get on the moon rather than worrying about staying on the moon. You never can tell how this is going to run. In addition to that, there is a lot of theoretical simplicity built into the Blue Origin solution, especially if it bears resemblance to the original Boeing proposal. If that is the case, NASA may just go for simplicity over flexibility, reusability, and cost. It doesn't make a great deal of sense, but it would be something in keeping with NASA's philosophy versus the far more risky, far more innovative SpaceX solution that they've already embraced. Do they want to embrace another innovative solution or go with something that they know? That also could win this bid for Blue Origin. And then, of course, the whole fact that Jeff Bezos is likely to sue NASA the moment he doesn't win this bid and hold up the process for another six months I hate to be cynical, but that could influence this choice as well. But it's my hope that NASA makes the logical choice, the choice of lander that will be the most compatible with Starship. Starship can carry enormous amounts of fuel, would serve as a fantastic refueling tanker for Alpaca. The two landers working in concert would give us unprecedented access to the lunar surface throughout the 2030s and 40s. Let's hope that NASA makes the right choice. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please hit those notification bells, and also please keep in mind my GoFundMe page if you'd like to support my move to Europe, and as always, stay angry about space.